So my name is Jocelyn Evans. Um, I'm a con consultant dietitian. Um, I was the, or I, I, I should say, I currently am the past chair um, the, of the consulting group. Um, and I'm going to present today with Stephanie Johnson. So we're going to kind of bop back and forth, um, probably interject some, some different comments. Um, cause we both actually, we have very similar businesses, but very different at the same time. We've both taken different paths, um, but are also doing very similar things. So I can, I think I can, I can speak for both of us in saying that we're excited about this topic. We're both very passionate about our businesses and we're also passionate about long-term care and older adults. So, um, yeah, so before I kind of go into the background, um, I'm just going to go over the, our objectives today. So, um, number one, we're going to try to teach, um, our goal is for you to uh, learn the logistics of starting and maintaining a business and also learn more specifically about uh, self-employment in dietetics and some of the, the benefits and the challenges as well. So, so a little bit about me, um, kind of backing up prior to even becoming a dietitian, I was actually a, a CNA in a long-term care facility for a couple of years. And I was also um, a patient care tech with um, an oncology department at a hospital. And I think what I learned in both of those jobs while I was going through college was that I loved the relationships that I built with the residents. Um, working in a hospital, it was of course more acute care than maybe we deal with in the long-term care setting, but a lot of those patients were actually, um, were patients for a long time, or at least they would come back to our, our floor. So I built really great relationships. And I think that's where I, I realized that my passion was in building those relationships. So, um, so fast forward going through my internship after I was done with school, um, I had two weeks of, I think something must have fallen through. And I had two weeks of open where I didn't have anything going on. And so I live in Huxley and I'm going to shout out to Andrea here, but um, my internship director was trying to find something for me and she found Andrea on, I think it might've been the eat right, um, find a, find an, uh, an expert link or find an expert tool and found Andrea. And so I actually spent two weeks with Andrea during my internship doing long-term care. And I think I, I learned an incredible amount in two weeks. And I think that's where I really found, um, my passion and knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, as my career, eventually uh, doing long-term care consulting. So um, fast forward, then I became a dietitian. Um, I worked at Hy-Vee for a couple years. You know, it was it was a good job, but it was something I knew that I didn't want to do for for the rest of my career. So an opportunity kind of fell in my lap to do a to have a long-term care facility. So I started out with one long-term care facility and I was also um, continued with hy V for a couple of years. Um, and then I, through networking, like Kathleen was talking about, I found, I, you know, picked up more facilities and eventually I was able to, to quit hy V and become a consultant full-time. Um, and then I fast forward, I had a, a baby, as you can see in my picture, my daughter, um, and I was actually able to stay home with her part-time and do consulting part-time. So that's probably one of the things I love most is the flexibility in consulting and that, you know, with a younger family. And that's one of the things that Stephanie and I, I think have bonded over is the flexibility. And, and we've, uh, we've had a great um, friendship through, through this. So, um, so that's one of the really great things about, about consulting. So I, in 2019, I started my own company um, and I, I started it as an LLC. That's how I registered it within the, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but, um, so I'm currently working under that, um, that company. I have multiple nursing facilities within my company. Um, I do have some different, um, subcontracting and things within that. So, um, but all of my business is done within that LLC. I also have some experience working with the Department on Aging and the Department on Public Health uh, for Iowa. And also, uh, if anyone's familiar with the Northeast Area Agency on Aging. Um, you know, as I work 
as I've worked in long-term care, I, I really believe in the quality of life and improving the quality of life for the residents living in those facilities. But I think one of the things that I have also developed a passion for is, is keeping older adults in the community as well. Um, and that really being one of our main goals as we are, you know, working in long-term care. So I've also gotten to, um, use that passion within the department on aging and the department of public health. So, um, so that's been some really great experiences working with, with those um, government entities as well. So a little bit personally, again, I'm, um, I'm married to my husband, James, and we have two kids. Um, you can see my daughter, Julia, she's almost four. And then we have a son, Jameson, who's two. So, um, you know, with, through building this business, it's given me a lot of opportunities for my family to stay home more and, and a lot more flexibility. So, so that's been really wonderful. And then my why, you know, within, with my business is really improving the quality of life for older adults, um, living in long-term care and living in the community, um, just through my passion for teaching and also for, for quality nutrition care. Um, I, one of the things I've realized is I really love to teach younger dietitians coming into this field, um, and, you know, improving the quality of care that we as dietitians give. Cause I feel like sometimes we're on a lot of little islands throughout. Um, cause we're not really, we don't really get to work together. We're at a facility and we, you know, we're on our own. We're the expert in that facility. So it's nice to have, you know, especially with, um, the consultant group here, it's really great to have a community and to bounce ideas off of, um, and Stephanie and I, again, have, gr have, um, garnered a really great relationship, just bouncing ideas off of each other about our businesses and about, um, our care in our nursing homes. So, yeah. so yeah, that's a little bit about me and I'll turn it over to Steph. All right. Um, thank you, Jocelyn. So, yeah. So like jo Jocelyn said, um, it's been so valuable, you know, the IDHCC has been so valuable in helping me network and meet or expand relationships with dietitians that I may have known, but um, really having good resources within um, the group. So I know, you know, shameless plug for the group, but if you're not a member of IDHCC yet, definitely join us because um, it's really been a, just an, an unbelievable resource for me as I, you know, have grown my business and um, gone out on my own. So and like Jocelyn said, we've become good friends through all this, even though, as you can see, I'm much older than her. We have the same age kids. And um, I've been a dietitian for about 10 more years, I think, uh, than Jocelyn. But you, it, it doesn't feel like we're any different. You know, we, like I said, we have kids the same age and we both have our own businesses and it's been really great. So um, I have been a dietitian for 15 years. Um, no. How many years is that? 17. 17 years. Um, and I started my own um, consulting business in 2015. I have been in long-term care for 10 years. Um, I started as a full-time dietitian um, for Good Samaritan down in Indianola, where I was both the dietitian and the dietary manager. Um, and I've done, I like to say I've done everything under the sun when it comes to dietetics, but I am so glad that I landed in that position at Good Samaritan. And it taught me so much about um, not only long-term care, but also being a dietary manager, um, really an invaluable experience. Um, I started my long-term care, I guess I should say back when I was in college as well, I worked um, as a dietary aide and a cook uh, for um, a facility in Ames. And so that was my first exposure to um, kind of the, the dietary realm. So that was also a great experience. But um, so currently I'm working at three different skilled and long-term care communities in central Iowa. And I did just accept a job um, working with Mercy One Hospice as well. Um, so I'll be starting that uh, very soon. Um, I'm also a beauty counter consultant, like some of you also heard, which falls under my, my business and my entity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then I'm married to Justin. And you can see us uh, down on the, the High Trestle Bridge. We, are, uh, we love to, to cycle. And um, I, I also love to do yoga. So that's kind of what I try to do in my spare time. I miss. I miss biking this time of year. Makes me want to move to Arizona, but here we are. So, and then I have Gavin and Chase, my two boys. And, um, you know, Joss and I, when we were talking about doing this presentation, I'm like, let's talk about a little bit about why we do what we do. And I always think this is a good, 
just a great thing for all of us to do. Like your why, why you work at your job, why you do what you do, what you do every day, just to kind of revisit that every so often, because that's something that can change and that can, um, that can completely vary from year to year, you know, throughout our career. So, you know, I sat down and really thought about this, but um, I'm definitely like a type A firstborn personality and I like to do things my way. I, I don't, I don't beat around the bush. I'm a very direct person. And that was part of the reason that I started my own business. Um, I worked for other dietitians and they were great, but I just found myself um, saying to myself and my husband even said to me, why aren't you just doing this for yourself? Why are you working for someone else? And so I was like, you know what? You're right. Let's do this. So um, I like to do things my way and I like to make positive and lasting impacts on the lives of those around me. So that, of course, includes the residents that I work around every day, but also my coworkers, my friends, my family. Um, I like to say that I'm a hard person to forget, and I I like that. So um, so anyways, so let's kind of get started here. So first, we're going to talk about the logistics of owning and maintaining a business and how to get started. So when we talk about traits of successful business owners, Um, these were just kind of some ones that we came up with, especially when it comes to being a long-term care dietitian or a dietitian in healthcare. So I think it's very important that we are determined and resilient. So when you open your own business, you have to believe in yourself and you have to believe that you're going to succeed from day one. The The upfront legwork of starting your own business can really be a lot. It can be frustrating. Um, You're going to have setbacks. You're going to have periods of chaos. There's a big learning curve with it. You have to just believe in yourself and know that this is, this is what you want to do and that you're going to succeed. Um, Having confidence, but also being humble. One of the things is that you do have to market yourself um, and advocate that you will be an asset to the company that you want to work for. So there are going to be uncomfortable situations. You may be talking to an administrator or an executive director that already has a dietitian, but they may not be 100% satisfied with um, the services that we're, that they're getting. So you may be taking someone else's job and no one wants to do that. No one, I mean, I suppose there are people out there that want to do that and that are comfortable with that, but I would say probably most people are not comfortable with that, but it's part of it's part of this career, it's part of this job. So you do have to be humble in that aspect and realize like, you don't want to be overly confident or cocky about that, like be respectful of that other person. And then also you need to let, Jocelyn and I have talked about this, you have to let go of that piece of your personality. And this is probably a type A type personality or uh, personality trait. But you have to let go of the fact that you are that you feel like you should get every job. Um, you may have meetings with administrators or EDs that you you just want to network with them. Like Kathleen was talking about it. They may never contact you again to um, come and be their dietitian, or they may leave and get another job and their situation may change. Don't, don't take that to heart um, because it's oftentimes not necessarily an interview. It's, it's just more of a networking opportunity um, an opportunity to give them your business card, to give them their resume, but you are not always going to get a job with the person that you meet with. Um, it's hard to know what the situation is at, at the facility that they're at. And especially during this time, you know, there's not a lot of in-person meetings going on unless you already work at the facility. So again, if there's a place that you're interested in working or, or being a part of, reach out and network. Um, but let go of that piece of feeling like you have to get every job that you're interested in. I think we, uh, Jocelyn mentioned this, but um, being passionate, you have to love what you're doing and it doesn't have to be long-term care. Uh, You may find a passion in or outside of dietetics, um, but you have to be passionate about it because it takes a lot of work um, to start your own business and maintain that. Um, Adaptable and open-minded. Um, Every facility that I've, that I've worked at over the course of my career has a different idea of an expectation of the role that the dietitian is going to have. And I'm not saying let people walk all over you. Um, You know, we have to set boundaries. Uh, For most of us, 
we may be at the facilities one to two days a week, maybe not even that often. You have to set boundaries as far as how much you can do and what really needs to be the responsibility of a person that is in that building um, full time. Um, but at some buildings, I've attended care plans. At some buildings, I have done all the MDSs. At some buildings, I don't do that. Um, the dietary manager takes care of, of both of those duties. So again, just um, being, being open-minded to what, where they see your role um, as their dietitian. Um, good with managing money. So this is something that we'll talk about later on, but I will be honest, this is not my strength. I am not someone that functions well under a budget. Um, but I've had to learn to learn, I've had to learn that it's a very important piece of having a business. You have to keep good records. You have to, of course, pay your taxes. You have to know how to send billing. We'll talk about all that stuff later, but, um, th this is just something I, I'm just honest about, not something that I am great with, but something that I've learned a lot about. Um, and then I put a natural networker. I think this is something that you can learn to be natural at, but I know Kathleen talked a lot about networking and I think that is obviously super important. And then self-reliant and responsible. Um, again, when you own your own business, you have to hold yourself accountable. Of course, other people are going to be pay paying attention to what you're doing, but ultimately you have to rely on yourself. You have to show up, you have to do your job. And you, that has to be something that's, that's valuable to you as a business owner. So kind of going along those same traits as far as, um, or talking about traits, talk a little bit about habits of a successful business owner. Um, the first thing is, and this I'll talk a little bit more about too, as far as steps to starting your own business, but lots of research, lots of reading, um, listening to podcasts. I'm, I'm a chronic multitasker. So I listen to podcasts constantly, um, any way that, you know, I can consume more information. Um, and it is really important again, you know, as we're all working on our, in our own facilities, it's hard to stay up to date on certain things as far as, you know, regulation changes, um, especially, you know, some of the PDPM stuff that changes it's, it's, it's all on us as a, you know, as a dietitian to be the expert in it. So, so that's, you know, figuring it out on your own time. Um, and really just being proactive and wanting to continue that, that research, um, scheduling time for the, you know, the book work and even personal time, um, I think is important because I, I'm terrible about this, but I, you know, want to get my work done and I don't do anything else until I get that work done. So it, it is really helpful to, you know, as a business owner to schedule time, um, for those little things. Um, and you know, there is, depending on the type of business you have, it, you may not have a lot of book work, um, but we all are, we all have some level of it within our, you know, within our consulting as far as even just keeping track of our time. Um, so it's important to block out time for those things. Being selective about what to put on your plate. Um, Steph kind of talked about this and it, I, what I found to be most helpful is setting those expectations during the contract, during the negotiation, um, and really understanding how long the facility wants you to be there every week, um, making sure there's an hour, you know, in your, within your contract, an hour ex expectation. Um, you know, if they want you to be there on a certain day, that's probably one of the, you know, biggest things, especially, um, if they do want you to, attend their care conferences or, you know, be there for a Medicare meeting or have a weight skin meeting on a certain day every week. Um, so just make sure those expectations are clear when you are doing your negotiation, because you could have two potential facilities wanting you to be there on Tuesday. Well, it's just not, it's just not feasible. So, so just being selective about what, what you are able to put on your plate. Um, setting very realistic and clear goals. This kind of goes along with that, but, you know, I found that, you know, setting goals for myself helps and this, you may not have a business that you want to expand. You may just have, you know, a couple facilities and, and that, and you're good with that, but it's still important that, you know, we all continue to grow. Um, and so setting those clear goals is, is a really great habit of a, of a business owner. Uh, creating a successful routine that works for you. I think this is particularly important within a facility. 
I don't know. I, I'm sure most of you have run across this, but you know, you're, you're at a facility and you look at the clock and it's two 30 and you don't even know what you did that day. So, um, so a lot of, you know, priorities, things that you want to get done may fall by the wayside. Um, so really creating a, a routine that, that works for you at your buildings. And, um, we kind of talked about this too, but the ability to hear constructive criticism and accept failures. I'm also a very type A personality and a perfectionist. And so I'm not great at, um, at, you know, quote unquote rejection. Um, but I have had facilities where I've gone for an interview and not gotten it. And it's really easy to, you know, to get down on yourself. But, but like we said before, it, you just have to be resilient and knowing, you know, this is what you want to do. And a lot of times it is about networking. It's about who, you know, um, and so that's just kind of one of the, what happens within our business, within our um, careers. So, Justin, I want to talk to you more about this routine that you speak of. Yes. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I just, I, yesterday, I don't think I opened my computer till 1230, maybe once I got to my facility, because I was working on other things that were more important that came, that came down the pipe and um, like you said, we, it's good to have an idea of, of a routine, but also realizing that um, it's probably going to get disrupted. And um, that's just part of, part of our job too. So. Yeah. And, you know, going off of that a little bit, what, what, what I found, what has worked well for me is before I do anything, I really prioritize what I need to do that day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, and new, new admissions are typically on the top of that list because they're, they're more time sensitive. But, you know, sometimes it could be, um, you know, you have a weight and skin meeting at a certain time. So you really need to prep for that. Or mm -hmm. uh, you have a resident that's that goes out to dialysis. I have I have an issue with that at one of my facilities. I have a resident that goes out for dialysis um, the day that I'm there every week. And so I, I really mm -hmm. struggle with talking to him. So I really have to prioritize um, when to see him so that I don't miss him because I, I, you know, I'm our our time is limited. So, yeah that routine is yeah. really, really important. And I think one of the things I do to try to stay on track track with that is as much as I don't like taking work home, that's another thing that I've had to let go of. Um, I always prep, you know, I always look at, um, I have remote access everywhere that I work, which I would recommend getting that if you don't have that already. Um, but I always look at kind of to see how many admissions that we've had, you know, what's going on with weights, like don't wait until you're in the building um, for that, you know, check on that type of thing the day before, because sometimes you'll see weights that are really off and people that need reweighed. It's just kind of something I fit into my routine as making sure that I am setting myself up for a successful day. Because if I wait to do all of that once I'm in the building, it, it's all, all it does is make my day harder. So um, just, just a good practice to get into. Absolutely. <clears throat> so I, I think Stephanie, what I, and I would both classify ourselves as entrepreneurs. Um, so this is just a quote I kind of thought was all encompassing. Um, you know, what we do, it's not really a job, um, even a career, it's a lifestyle. Um, we don't really get vacations. It's well, at least it's not easy. Um, you know, going home at 6 PM, like Steph said, you know, doing work after I'm, I do work almost, I hate to even admit this, but I probably do work five to six nights out of the week after my kids go to bed. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it, it's, but I, I love, I love my career. I love my business and it's just kind of what I've sacrificed. Um, so I just want to put this little quote and just knowing that it is really rewarding and it is fulfilling. And if, and honestly, if it's, if you don't feel that the, if there isn't that reward or that fulfilling feeling, it probably isn't the job, the, the path for you. So. Definitely. So some steps to starting, um, you know, if you, and what, 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 honestly, what I did was I was already working as a consultant and then I started my business. So, um, you don't have to, you know, come start a business right away, but there is, um, there's, 
benefits to, to working within an LLC as a consultant, which we'll kind of talk about. But um, so number one, consult conducting any research to determine, you know, what your market is. Maybe you just want long-term care facilities. Uh, maybe, the, you know, those are your clients and that's just fine. Um, I, like I said before, I kind of have expanded into doing, working with some state entities. So, um, but just figuring out what your, your market is. Um, writing a business plan. What are your passions? I, again, we're, we've talked a lot about passion, but you, you, it, it's the driving force in our business, in our work. Um, so as when I was, you know, considering, um, starting a consulting business and LLC, I was, I would have a note in my phone and I would, anytime I had an idea, I would put it down. Um, so, and I still have that note in there. So anytime, you know, something comes to me, I just write it down quick. So, um, you know, a business plan is something though, even, even if it's small, um, it is really essential prior to starting the business, um, funding the business. I would say one of the great things about our profession is uh, in consulting is there isn't a lot of expenses. Um, probably my personal biggest one was a computer, but, um, you know, every business is a little different, so you might have different expenses, but that is one of the good things. I don't think there's a, uh, there would be a ton of startup costs. Um, choosing your business name and registering your business within your state. Um, every state's a little different. Iowa, I believe it's just with the Secretary of State as far as registering your business. Um, but there's also different kinds of, you know, got to keep up on your licensing and registration, different things. Um, drawing up contract templates. Uh, this really would be recommended to be done with, with a lawyer. Um, they can make sure that all your wording and everything is appropriate. Um, but you can also reach out to any um, mentors that you have or anyone else to get some, some feedback and some ideas on what you should have in your contract. Um, and then next, reaching out to your prospective clients. So this is where, again, that marketing is huge, or excuse me, that networking is huge. Um, and just having some prospects that you can call, email. Um, and again, that's figuring out who your market was first, but then reaching out and then opening up a business bank account. I think, I think this is really important just to keep everything separate. It helps you at the end of the year when you're doing your taxes, um, that everything is really separate. So, um, not a, you know, it, it's fairly easy, um, but it's easier at the end of the year to just keep everything the same in the same bank account. Yeah. And to add to that, once you establish your business name and you start your LLC, um, you will get an employee, uh, employee identification number and EIN. And once you have that go and open your business bank account is the best advice that I can give you is to keep to keep it separate. Um, I know that not all, all dietitians operate that way, but it makes tracking all that much easier. You know, if you forget to write down a business expense, you can go back to your bank account and you can look back and be like, oh, I forgot about that lunch that I had or because, you know, things that you don't think about. And again, during this past year, I haven't been doing as much of it. But if you go out to lunch with someone that, that you work with, like if Jocelyn and I were to go out to lunch together, and we talk about our businesses, like we can use that as a write off. Um, and so I always like if I do that, I use my, my business bank account, I don't use my personal bank account, and then I put that into my expenses. So um, definitely, like I advise if you have your own business, or you, uh, and you don't have your have a business bank account, like, do it. Um, super important. And then back to um, when Jocelyn was talking about funding your business. When I was uh, when I first was, con when I was consulting under a, under a different company, um, I did buy a couple of contracts from her that I was working at. And so I did have to get a small business loan and you do have to have a business plan um, in order to get any sort of money from a bank. And we have a pretty low risk business. Again, like Jocelyn said, we, um, we don't have a lot of startup costs. We're not buying inventory. We're not paying rent at a building, you know, some, you know, usually when you start up a small business, there's a lot of upfront costs. And that definitely isn't the case with us. But um, it was really good practice for me to write a business plan. And I'm glad that I ended up having to do that. Um, because it does make you think about um, what you're getting yourself into and kind of what what you're wanting to do. But so I had to get money to buy out contracts from the, the business I was working for. And then also I 
like Jocelyn said, I bought a new computer. And so um, having that business loan, like that also like can be a tax write off. And you can set up payments like you would for anything else, you know, buying a car or whatever, and paying that out of your business account. So, um, so just kind of keep that in mind, like anything that you're buying that, uh, and that this includes like fees to, um, to AND, um, fees to IDHCC, uh, fees for this presentation, like all of that can be counted as business write off. So, um, so again, just, just super helpful to be organized about that. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, again, um, talking about passion and how to find your passion. Um, I think these questions are helpful in, and if you did want to start your own business, um, trying to figure out, you know, what you want to focus on. So number one, who do I most want to help? Um, I can, I can tell you that when I was doing this, um, the first thing I thought of was, was the older adults, of course, um, you know, older adults living in long-term care, all older adults living in the community. But what I've found is I, I also have realized I want to help other dietitians coming into this field. Um, it's, it's tough to come in because you really don't know what, what to expect. I can tell you with the first facility that I ever had, um, I thought I was going there for an interview and I got there and, and they told me that it was my first day and there was no other dietitian to show me where anything was. So that first day I was there, I just had to jump in and I'm thankful for it now because I kind of, I, I learned, I don't know if it was the hard way or the, the tough way, but I did learn a lot in that. And, um, so I've, I've realized through consulting is I really want to help also other dietitians. So, um, number two, what problem do I most want to solve? And also what solution do I most want to provide? So again, for myself, you know, improving nutrition care within uh, long-term care and also, you know, not only for the older adults, but also improving nutrition care from the dietitian, providing more, you know, consistent care. Um, we all do things a little different and that's great. Um, but also just having, again, that community uh, in bouncing ideas off of and providing, you know, some of the starting points for, for some of our nutrition care. So um, I think it's really helpful, again, to shadow professions in different fields, do lots of research again, um, brainstorm some ideas, meet with, meet with some dietitians that have their own businesses and see, you know, you know, sit down and ask them specific questions um, with really the goal for all of us to have a job that doesn't feel like a job. I go into work every day and it, it doesn't feel, I, I love it. I love seeing my residents. Um, I've got, had the opportunity to be able to go into all my facilities throughout COVID. So, um, it's, I've been thankful for that. Cause I've, one of my favorite parts of my job is seeing the residents. So it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like a job to me. Um, so that's how I, I personally know I'm within my passions. Um, and maybe your passion has changed, you know, throughout, throughout your work, maybe, um, maybe you're, halfway through your career and you realize this just isn't for me, asking yourself these questions um, would be really helpful. Yeah, I have to add to Jocelyn saying she showed up for what she thought was a job interview. Um, when I showed up as for my first job in long-term care, I thought I got hired to be their dietitian. Um, didn't find out until I went back to the dietary department um, that I was also going to be the dietary manager and I was now the manager of 25 employees, <laughs> never been a manager before. <laughs> so it was a shock, but best thing that ever happened to me for, in my entire career. So. And again, with, you know, thinking outside of the box, you know, like, like has Stephanie said, she, she does things within her business that have nothing to do with long-term care. Um, and I do things within my business that aren't specifically long-term care, you know, more of the just older adults. So, um, it doesn't, and I'm one of those people that likes doing a lot of different things. I don't like my day to be the same every week. So, or every day. Um, so I think that I've found that I really love doing a lot of different things. Um, but it also takes a lot more organization and motivation, you know, to do really to do those things because I'm, 
I don't have anybody overseeing me. It's all on me to make sure that things are done. So think outside of the box. It may not be, um, may not be only long-term care. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a good point. Um, you know, consulting, I feel like is a good fit for people that like working different places that like having a lot of variety in what they're doing and a lot of variety in their day. If you know yourself well enough to know, like, that's not really what I'm going for. I like consistency. I like, um, I like more of a, a routine. I'm going to the same, same building every day. Um, this is probably not the job for you. <laughs> so it's cause it's, it is, it's fun and it's exciting, but it can, it can be, it can be rough and you, you do have to be very organized in that. So, um, so this is kind of building on to when it comes to starting your business, some things that you have to look at and continue to do throughout owning and maintaining your business. Um, so when I, so you definitely have to be familiar with the laws um, about registering and starting a business. And also, like I said, maintaining a business. So I, um, when I first started my business, I immediately sought out the help of a lawyer just because I felt like that was um, the best route for me. Um, so he actually helped me establish my LLC um, he keeps me on track. Like if um, you have, you have uh, biennial fees. So every other year I have to pay fees to maintain my business. So he sends me an email when those are due um, and he can kind of help me as much as I need to. Um, because when you own your own business, you're supposed to have like yearly meetings and, and have notes and stuff. And, you know, I'm just self-employed. I don't have any employees. So mine is really straightforward, but that's, just something that I've been very um, thankful for. Like lawyers are not cheap. We all know that, but I feel like a very valuable contact and resources to, and to make sure you're doing things um, legally and, um, and you're not forgetting about something because you don't know about it. So um, that's been a very valuable addition to, to my business. Um, and he is my registered agent as well. So you don't have to do things that way, but that's just how I've done things. And then um my CPA is the bomb. I love him. I mean, he, he has helped me so much. Um, he works with a lot of small businesses. Um, and I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, I'm going to check the time. Yeah, we got a little, we got, we're good. So, um, but a, a CPA is going to be a invaluable part of your team when it comes to, to owning a business. Um, I know Kathleen talked about this as well, but um, reaching out to mentors, having people that have been doing this for longer than you. Uh, I feel like I have been that person for a couple of people that I know. And it is, and like Jocelyn said, it is really great to help out, you know, younger dietitians or dietitians that are just starting um, in this, in this field. Um, again, Kathleen talked a lot about liability insurance, so I won't talk more about that, but, uh, but something you, you absolutely need um, to, to do this. For your job and then again back to the money management but long-term care facilities will will oftentimes pay you an hourly rate but you're paid as a contractor so again you have to pay your own taxes none of the taxes come out of that um you're considered to be a 1099 um instead of a w-2 uh employee or contractor of that company so again um I can't say enough good things about uh, my CPA. I have probably referred like 20 people to him. So he better put me in as well. Um, <laughs> but, no, he's always like so appreciative and so thankful. Um, he's a small business owner too. So I think he really understands the value of it. But um, if anyone would like um, his information or if you're looking for a CPA, his, he's located in Urbandale. So um, for those of you that live in central Iowa, he's great. But um, he has helped me so much. And I am definitely one of those people I'll sit across the table from you and I'm going to tell you if I don't understand something and I need more information because I want to understand as much as I possibly can and so he has been so wonderful about that because I went in knowing nothing and um, have good systems in place to track expenses I know I already touched on that but just keep in mind tax write-offs super just super beneficial um uh so Jocelyn and I differ in this aspect. So I have been, I designated my business as an S corp um, versus an LLC. I don't really like want to sit here and explain what that means, but it's basically just two different tax um, breakdowns. Uh, I'm considered to be my own, my own employee. Like my, I am an employee of my company. 
And so it's just kind of differs on how, how I pay taxes. Um, my CPA does take care of, I pay him to pay all of my taxes because I don't want to have to remember to do it. So, um, so that just different, there's different divisions of, of, um, of that uh, for self-employment or small business ownership. And we talked about that. You most likely will be using 1099 forms versus W-2s. Um, so educating yourself about the difference with those. Um, you pay your own taxes. Don't forget about it. Don't, don't wait until you file your taxes at the end of the year. Um, if you do things that way, you better have a good chunk of money set aside because you're going to owe some money. Um, so when I first started out, so I should say my dad is actually a retired CPA. So when I was first starting out, he did help me, but he said, make sure you're setting aside money and you, you do absolutely need to do that um, to make sure you have enough to pay those taxes. Yeah. And I might, I might add on that stuff. Yeah. Um, and we, and like, like Steph said, we differ a little bit with the taxes. Um, I personally pay quarterly taxes, tax payments. Um, my, my CPA helps me to figure that out. Um, he usually goes off of what I paid last year and tries to estimate what I'll pay this year. Um, sometimes I, if my, if it, my income has changed a little bit, I'll tweak that number. Um, but he does help me with that. And I know Steph, you pay yours monthly or your CPA helps you pay yours yep. monthly. So, so we do, but, um, it is essential that you, you pay throughout the year. Um, otherwise I, and I'm not an accountant, so I can't say for sure, but I've always understood that if you do not pay it throughout the year, you will potentially be, you know, fined for that. So, um, keep right. that in mind, um, as that's a really important thing. And then I also wanted to just touch on as far as expenses, I, you know, I use part of my home as an office. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of my expenses do come, um, come from, you know, my electricity and my water, um, any, uh, trash removal, um, internet, your phone. Um, there's a lot of things. And that's just one thing that a CPA, um, will assist with is figuring out, you know, what, what can be used as, as write-offs or expenses and what cannot, but, um, Absolutely. for my personal taxes, I, or for my business, part of my, part of my house is my office. So I just right. wanted to kind of touch on that. Definitely. And you do, I mean, it's going to be a percentage. It's not that you can write off, you know, 100% of your, you know, your elect electric bill, but you, you do have to have a designated office in your house that is not um, it can't be like, um, you know, your bed can't be in the same room. Like, you know, if you were to get audited, that is something that technically is not allowed. So, all right. So one of the things we have to do, did you have anything else, Jocelyn, about that? Okay. So one of the things you have to do, of course, is send billing. That's how we get paid. Um, so invoices are typically sent monthly. Um, so you send them at the end of the month or the beginning of the next month. I know some of my facilities love it when I can give, get them my invoice before the month is over. So, uh, you know, if I have time to send that on the last day of the month, I definitely do try to. Um, but this can be specified in your contract and you can use the template of, of your choosing. I just use the one that comes with, with Max. So they have like an invoice um, template and it's worked for me. Um, so... Also, it's good to specify within your contract when you expect to be paid. Um, I've had issues with this, I'm not going to lie. Um, but also the facility, because in my contract, in my original contract, it does say that I am going to charge interest um, if payment is not received within a certain date. And sure enough, that that the, that company took that right out of the contract when they when we were working on contract negotiation because they knew they weren't going to pay me within that 30 days. I mean, there was definitely times where it was like 60, 90 days and I had to kind of get on their, you know, billing person about it. Um, so that can be a frustrating thing. You know, if you're used to getting paid every two weeks, every week, um, you may have to, you know, realize that that's not going to happen anymore. Cause sometimes it's hard to know exactly when you're going to get that payment. Um, another thing is uh, some Companies will reimburse for mileage, for mileage, for mileage, and some choose not to do this. So this is something to talk about when you are working on contract negotiation. Um, it is a uh, non-taxable um, 
income uh, and you must re report that to your CPA, but it, it can be, it's part of something you can use as a write-off. Um, so I do work with two facilities right now that pay mileage and one that doesn't. And uh, again, it's just part of your negotiation. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left. So I feel like we've talked about some of this already, but um, was this mine? You want me to talk about this, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, so some benefits of owning your own business, of course, we've talked a lot about flexibility and having young families. Um, you know, there's definitely been times where I'm very thankful that I can get my work done at home. You know, if I have a sick child, if I have to leave early for an appointment, um, it, it's definitely easier now than what it used to be when, you know, I was working for, for someone else. So um, setting your own schedule, again, you know, you, you may have a facility that would really like you to come on Tuesdays, but if you already go somewhere else on Tuesday or if you have something else on Tuesdays, the, you know, places will work with you. and um, just being able to set your own schedule. If you don't want to work full time, you definitely don't have to. Um, I think Jocelyn and I would both consider ourselves like more part time um, people at this stage of life, which has been really good um, with having a young family. Um, typically, typically, you do make a higher hourly wage, but we'll talk about that in some of the downfalls of owning your own business. Is yes, it seems higher um, at the the front end, um, but after you think about some of the other things that you have to pay for yourself um, may not always be the case, but typically you do make a higher hour, hourly wage. And um, it may open up doors for other opportunities within or outside of dietetics as far as um, under the umbrella of what your, you decide your, you want your business to be. Um, so like I mentioned, I, I do a couple of other things besides um, working in long-term care. Um, I work as a beauty counter consultant. I work for a company called RQA and I do um, audits for them. And then I'm also taking on this new role in a hospice um, for Mercy Hospice. So again, like you just, you never know what opportunities are going to come up that you may want to take advantage of. And when you are not tied to a full-time job, it just can, um, can make those um, opportunities more possible. Yeah, so um, kind of on the opposite side of some of those, some of the challenges, um, you know, you don't have time off. You, I should say you don't have paid time off. Um, you know, you can't just take a week off a of work to go on vacation. Um, you either, you know, typically some of us may find someone to cover for us or we'll just work ahead to the best of our ability or we'll work on vacation. I may have may or may not have been known to do that. Um, so None of us really want to do that, but it's just, it is just part of the, the challenge. And a lot of the, the tough part of some of our work is some of it is time sensitive. So, you know, there's, you know, MDSs that need to be done by a certain date. There's weights that need to be um, addressed, you know, by in a certain time period, there's pressure injuries that need to be addressed as well. So, so that is definitely one of the, the downfalls. Um, another one of the challenges is no benefits, you know, we don't get health insurance, retirement, um, again, any paid time off or, you know, and one of the tough things for, for both Stephanie and I has been maternity leaves. Um, you, you don't, you don't get paid, you know, short-term disability or anything. Um, so not only do you have to find someone to cover for you, but, but you also don't get paid. So that's, that is one of the tough, the tough things, mm -hmm. uh, in our stages of life with, with consulting. Um, you work alone again, all of it depends solely on you. You're the expert in your building. Um, but having a good, again, having a good community, a good network of people, you can always reach out. Um, but, but within your facility, you, you are by yourself, uh, staying up to date on your, you know, regulations, um, licensure. I know when I was working at hy V, I would get emails if my licensure was coming up for, um, mm -hmm renewal or, you know, different things like that. So that is one of the things you do need to, um, do on your own, um, paying for paying for things. Again, when I worked at hy V, I I believe, um, some of our licensure and, uh, academy dues and things were, um, were covered. So that's one thing you do have to, Hold up. Sorry, it guys. Looks, I don't know what happened right there. It's fine. It's just a little smaller. 
Here we go. Okay. Um, and again, you can use a lot of those as business expenses, but you do need to um, incur the costs of, of those, your CEUs, um, all the different kinds of memberships. Uh, there's not as much job security. Um, I'm sure most of us have had this happen to us or know someone that's happened where your contract has been cut without maybe any um, forewarning. Um, they may not be happy with their service. They may be looking to cut costs. Um, they don't, they don't need to give you a reason, unfortunately. Um, but typically in your contract, you'll say, um, you know, there, there's a certain time period that they have to give you a notice. And typically that's 30 day notice, um, for you or the facility to, to notify, um, of a contract being, um, discontinued. So, and then again, it's hard. This is probably hard for all of us, for everybody right now, because most of us um, have been doing more work from home, but it's really hard to not take your work home. Um, I kind of feel like I always have something to do. So it is sometimes an unsettling feeling, um, feeling like you just don't, you just don't have it all done. But um, that's just one of the things that, you know, by organization, um, priorities, scheduling, um, you can alleviate some of that stress, but that is definitely one of the downfalls. And I'll tell you another thing. I, I have, I had one facility in the past that would call me at all hours of the day and night to notify me of things. And while I appreciated that, um, I also didn't really probably need to know somebody had a pressure injury at midnight. Um, I probably could have waited till the next day, but so again, you're, you are typically expected to be on call for them um, at all times. Or, and another thing is you can specify that in your contract. You know, if, if you don't wanna be notified or don't wanna be, um, if that's your expectation, then, um, and that was probably an isolated experience. I've never, I hadn't had that happen at any other facility, but um, that might be something to think about during your contract, contract negotiation is what, what your expectations are to be um, to be contacted, you know, whether it's not on the weekends too, that's another thing. Um, I have a facility that calls me currently calls me all the time, um, which is fine, but I would consider that in my future contracts of, um, probably limiting some of that. Yeah. And I think, um, the, the boundary thing is important. Um, it's okay to set boundaries, you know, within your, your facility and communicate that, um, so even though it, it can be hard and again, maybe not the most comfortable conversation, but you also need to lay down your expectations and, and have boundaries. And I think that is totally acceptable. So look at that. That's good. 124. Timing. Does anybody yeah. have any questions that we can address or if anyone wants to put it in the chat box, we can address it. Yeah, I don't have my chat box open, but I'm going to open mine back up. I know how to do that. Okay, so we have a um, question here. Do you need to have a diet manual, paper or digital, or digital, I'm sorry, of your own or just use what the facility has? E either way, I think most of my facilities have one, but I, I don't think it would be a bad idea to have one on, on your, you know, on your person to just have an extra copy Perfect. And the other one is an hourly wage. What do you want to earn? How do you set your billing rate to earn that? Um, for example, charge $50 an hour to net $25 an hour. That's tough. I think I can start. Um, I think that my expenses are different every year, so it's kind of hard to figure out what I net. Um, but I would say what has worked well for me in the past is kind of doing like market research and figuring out what other facilities in that area are typically paying. If, if, if there's a way to figure that out. Um, it, it's really tough. Um, I, when I, I can say when I, um, some of the bigger corporations, they, they sometimes do have like more specific numbers that maybe could help you. I know that that helped me. Um, but there, I, I think what I'll say without giving any specific numbers, because I think everybody makes a little bit different amount is that um, 
just doing, again, doing that market research within um, the area to see kind of what, because I think Des Moines area may pay different than, you know, Southern Iowa or, or vice versa. Yeah. And I, I will agree with that. And it, I think it can depend too, if it's your, you know, with contract negotiation and salary type, type conversations, um, can depend on if it's an independently owned facility versus a big corporation. Um, I've found that there's been, it's been vastly different depending on, on that factor. So. Hope you're on and then, Oh, sorry. Um, the third question then is how do you find coverage for six days, um, family medical or vacation? So I can kind of start out with this too. And this is where Stephanie and I have, have helped each other out with, within, mm -hmm. uh, she, I covered for her, um, recent maternity leave. Um, but as far as, you know, sick days, honestly, I personally just go a different day or, or work from home. Um, mm -hmm. you know, as, as far as vacation, I just try to work ahead potentially, or go a different day. That's, um, that's what I personally do. Um, but, but like I said, one of my goals within my business is to build a bigger, a little bit of a bigger community to help with some of those things to alleviate. That. Yeah. I think that having, you know, if you're taking a week vacation, having someone else come in and try to cover your building for a week is pretty difficult. You know, they're not going to know any residents. They're not going to, it's doable, but it's, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult for that person. Um, I, so one of the vacations that I try to take yearly is, is RAGBRAI. Um, I am not available to like reconfigure a tube feeding when I'm on RAGBRAI. I'm not going to happen. I just communicate that, you know, they can send me an email and I definitely, you know, will try to check my email at the end of the day. Um, which if anybody knows anything about RAGBRAI, I don't know if I would trust myself to reconfigure a tube feeding <laughs> at the end of a day of RAGBRAI. But, um, the, you know, you just have to have a good relationship with people and they just are going to have to know that maybe you're not going to be available for a couple of days. Um, give them an emergency number. Like Jocelyn and I have talked about this, like we would be comfortable being that person. Um, if they run into a situation where they, um, they need a dietitian ASAP and one of us is out of the country or, you know, unreachable, um, having someone like that, that you really trust, um, to possibly cover that, you know, for you. Um, but as far as like bigger, like Jocelyn said, bigger leaves, like maternity leave or uh, more of a long-term leave. Um, so I have, I have always had people be subcontractors under my business. Um, when I do maternity leave, that way they sign a contract with me. Um, because you have to have, I would recommend that you have something in place, like a no, no compete clause. Um, of course, you want it to be people that you trust that are covering your maternity leave. But what if they go in and they're like, hey, I like this building. I'm looking for more business. I want to, I want to take this business, you know, from, from this person. And I'm not saying people would do that, but it does cover you for that, you know, having that not, no compete clause for people that are doing some coverage for you. So hopefully that answers that. It's not easy. It's not easy to, to do vacations and stuff, but it is doable. So do the facilities pay you from port to port or time in the facility only? Uh, time in the facility is all I get paid for. And I get, I, like I said, I get mileage, but I don't, I don't get to count that time. Same. I, I don't think I've ever had a facility pay me uh, like travel time or anything. Um, the mileage reimbursement kind of covers that in a way. Um, obviously it covers your gas and things too. And um, anything on your car, but. I, I have no, I personally do not. 